We're tunneling very successfully, very productively up Alaskan Way up until about the middle of last week when um, we started to encounter increasing resistance in trying to move the TBM forward. Uh, that came up at the latter part of last week um, when we basically ground to a halt and uh, weren't really able to advance the TBM in the manner that uh, we like to advance the TBM. We decided to uh, stop tunneling and to uh, develop a plan to, to see uh, what's uh, causing this resistance and our inability to move forward with the TVM as we planned. Right now we're developing plans to uh, access that area underground to uh, see uh, exactly what it is that's uh, limiting the progress of the TBM and it's going to take a while for us to implement those plans and see exactly what the situation is. There's thousands of guesses floating around but uh, until we get down there and, and see what the actual situation is, it's just speculation and guess. No, we don't have divers down there yet. We, we would be using divers for what's called a hyperbaric intervention to go in there under pressure. Uh, to see what's in the uh, in the plenum right behind the cutter head and then to see what's on the tunnel face right in front of the cutter head. Well we can't see anything yet because we can't get in there. When you go in the TBM there's a solid steel wall called a bulkhead and that's at the rear end of this plenum a chamber that's behind the cutter head. So as the material is excavated it comes into the plenum, it's mixed in the plenum and then the screw conveyor takes it out of the plenum. So there's something that's uh, restricting the TBM's ability to move forward, and it's either something that's worked its way inside the plenum, or it's something that's out in front of the machine that's uh, limiting our ability to push forward. So until we can actually get in the plenum and see what's in there, and look through the openings in the cutter head and see what's immediately in front of the machine, we don't know what the situation is. The best case is that there's there's something in, in the chamber behind the cutter head that's uh, keeping uh, the mixing arms from rotating, that's keep, not allowing the material to get into the screw conveyor, to remove the material from the cutter head so we can advance the machine. And it's something that we could fix or remove in a matter of days and resume tunneling. If it's something out in front of the cutter head that's blocking our progress, uh, that's more uh, difficult because we only have access to that through the openings in the cutter head and we would have to bring down some kind of equipment or tools to break up that obstruction or remove that obstruction so that we could proceed forward with tunneling. So like I said, we don't know if it's something internal behind the cutter head or something external out in front and until we actually get in there and see, uh, we, can, we can't make that determination. Well, theoretically, we're down in the native soils. We're below the zone that they filled. So we're in, we're in the native glacial soils. So we're not expecting to find artifacts or railroad locomotives or ships or something like that down there. We just don't know what the situation is, and that's why we need to get inside behind the cutter head to see what needs to be done to allow us to resume tunneling. And in order to do that, workers need to go through compression for a couple of hours, go in there, work for an hour, come back out, go through decompression for a few hours. And that's kind of a slow, inefficient way to work, but it's a quick way to get in there and see what the situation is once we uh, stabilize the surrounding ground and, and depressure the water so that we can pressure up inside the plenum. The other way of getting in is an atmospheric intervention, which we've done several of already. When we were in the safe havens and completely surrounded by treated ground, we didn't have any soil or water pressure acting uh, on the face of the machine that we had to counteract by introducing pressure into the plenum. So people could go and work in an unpressurized environment. They just opened the doors, went in, worked the whole shift in there. But to get to that stage here, we would need to have something that's similar to the safe havens that we stopped in earlier as we were coming up Alaskan Way that allowed us to do those atmospheric interventions. So it takes some time to construct something like that that the machine can be housed in to allow you to go in and work at atmospheric pressure. So it's kind of a trade-off. The, 
hyperbaric can get us in there quicker but if we have a lot of work to do it would take longer than an atmospheric intervention it's going to take longer to set the stage for an atmospheric intervention but once we got in there uh, then we be able to work uh, in a very efficient manner so we're still we're still analyzing the pros and cons of those two scenarios but ultimately uh, it's really dependent on exactly what we find and what needs to be done before we resume tunneling. Um, that's preparatory work. That's uh, essentially if we decided that we needed to have extended period of time to deal with the issue and we wanted to go in with an atmospheric intervention as opposed to a hyperbaric intervention. So we've mobilized this equipment. We've got a design set up for uh, putting these uh, unreinforced concrete piles in the ground to create this modified safe haven that would allow us to do an atmospheric intervention and work for extended hours. But uh, we're going to try to get in there under a hyperbaric intervention before we really implement this plan because this, this is a, a much longer duration uh, with respect to ultimately being able to get in there and work.